Well, good morning, Solano sisters and brothers. You know, as we approach the close of this year, and maybe like you, you're looking forward to a new year. Oh, Jesus, come 2021. Because this past year, as I've described before, has been a great cultural blizzard. It's been filled to the point of over-the-top being overwhelmed and overtaking with disease and death due to a virus that has taken the innocent lives of over 240,000 people in this country and over a million around the globe. We've seen an economic recession that has crippled families, caused small businesses and even church doors to close. We've heard the outcry that enough is enough as it relates to racial injustice. And all of this, while we still wait for the transfer of power on the heels of a presidential election (laughs) that has once again put on full display to the world just how divided a nation we live in. All of this has... Well, I've shared with you this, uh, this past year, I've been overwhelmed. I have had many sleepless nights and long days of anxiety and a heart gripped. And so as I've sought the Lord for a rope of hope to, to anchor me, the Lord has impressed on my heart and I, I feel compelled to share today uh, with conviction What is the best first response for God's people in these turbulent times? And I believe it's the discipline of lament. For God's people to cry out, oh Lord, how long? How long must we endure being separated, being divided? How long, oh Lord? Many are awaiting for this current administration to bring unity to our country, to bring a sense of calm, to maybe even heal the division in this land. But yet I hear the Lord say to the answer of how long when my people will seek my face and repent. So the passage that has been burning in my heart that I feel compelled to share this morning is from 2 Chronicles. It's one of the stories that, that's one of Israel, God's people's highlights. It's when they dedicate the temple after it's been built under the reign of King Solomon. In chapter 6 of 2 Chronicles, Solomon prays this amazing prayer that moves the heart of God. And in response to Solomon's prayer, God sends down fire to consume the sacrifice and the offering and fills the temple with his glory. And then God speaks. Join me in chapter 7 and verse 11 of 2 Chronicles where God's word reads, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. In verse 12, then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. In verse 13, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I love how Dr. Tony Evans commentates on this passage when he says, the arrival and departure of God's glory in his house 
points to an important lesson for modern Christians. For Israel, the way things worked in society was determined by the way things worked or did not work in the temple. So in the event that God left the temple, the problem showed up in the streets. Yet when God returned his manifest presence to the temple, the healing showed up in the streets as well. God's first concern in his kingdom agenda should be ours. We, however, get all worked up about what's happening or going to happen in the White House or the Supreme Court without giving much thought to what's happening or not happening in God's church. We must understand that if God doesn't see the church getting things right, it doesn't matter who we elect to the White House. Both judgment and healing start with the household of God. I believe, and I agree with Dr. Evans, that the reason for our cultural demise is spiritual. And if a problem is spiritual, its cure must be spiritual. Pursuing right relationship with God is truly the solution. So this morning, as we cry out corporately in lament of how long, O Lord, I want to lead us in an actual prayer, not just teach about prayer and talk about prayer, but us actually pray together as God's people because we have not lived up to our name. I want to lead you in this prayer as an elder and ask you to respond as the people. I invite you to quiet your heart. O oh, gracious God, our Father, forgive us because we've not lived up to our family name as your people. We have ignored your voice that tells us, blessed are the poor in spirit. But we have been rich in religious pride and we have been more ready to judge than to forgive. Forgive us, O oh God. O oh, gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to maim, what our hearts can no longer bear, even as we ignore your voice telling us, blessed are those who mourn. But we have not known much sorrow for our own sin. Lord, though you should guide us, we inform ourselves. We have tried to work off our own guilt. We have tried so hard to pile up good deeds that outweigh our sins. Forgive us, O oh God. Almighty God, we plead your mercy. Because we've tried to change through our own efforts, We've tried to heal ourselves and heal our land while ignoring your voice that says to us, blessed are the meek. But we are a stiff-necked people. We have tried to change our own hearts through sheer willpower. This has left some of us arrogant. This has left most of us anxious and depressed. Oh God, forgive us for trying to heal ourselves and our land. Redeeming God, extend your grace. When we think your truth is too high and your will too hard, even when you say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But we are filled to the full with other things. In your mercy, help us to see that all the things we strive for are shadows, but you are our substance. They are quicksands, but you are the mountain. They are shifting, but you are our anchor. And without you, we are of all people most miserable. Oh God, forgive us. Oh long suffering God, have mercy on us, your bride. We are so slow to learn, so prone to forget, and too deaf to hear you say, Blessed are the merciful. 
But we are harsh and impatient, more ready to resent than to forgive, more ready to fear than to love, more ready to keep our distance than to accept. God, have mercy and forgive us. Forgive us when we've ignored your voice that says, blessed are the peacemakers. But we have not sought reconciliation. We are more ready to be right than to listen well. We are more ready to compete than to help. We do not love one another as we should because we do not believe that you love us as you do. Oh God, forgive us our cold disbelief. Gracious God, forgive us, your bride. We've shamed your name. We've erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We've wasted hours in quarrels with one another. We've been slothful in the heavenly race. And our gospel witness has been discounted. Help us hear your voice that says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. But our lives do not challenge the world. We have not sought freedom for the oppressed, even though you freed us. We have not bound up the broken, even though you healed us. We have not forgiven others, even though you forgave us. We withhold kindness from the needy, even though you freely gave us your own son, Jesus Christ. We are without excuse, but not without hope. Oh God, forgive us and heal us. Gracious God, help us to hear your voice that says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. But we have hardly made it known that we are yours. Lord, have mercy on us. O oh God, God, forgive us and heal us so that we may bring hope and healing to our land. In the name of Jesus, we humbly ask. Amen. Well, hello, everybody. Um, it's been a long time since I've been up here or been in this building. Um, I miss all of you. I want to say that up front. Also want to say that I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. So um, the topic that I'm talking about tonight is trust, confidence, and it's about putting it in God and not in people. You know, it's probably an understatement to say this this world, this year has been the craziest year ever. Uh, Martin and I were just talking about it. It has flown by, but it is been absolutely crazy uh kind of hard to wrap my head around and every time i talk with people they express fear uncertainty loss anger they just want it over they want it fixed that's what i'm hearing everywhere i go like me they think about who's in charge or not in charge they or should i say we think about our systems and how they're broken we get caught up in the news cycle and wonder who we can count on for the truth because every station we turn may give us a different uh, view. Who do we count on, you know, in those instances? We're reeling from COVID-19. People are dying. There's job loss. There's been killings, protests, the election. We want whatever normal was normal again. Like I said, we want it fixed, and we pin our hopes on individuals and systems to make it right. We can get so wrapped up in it that we lose sight of God in whom our trust and confidence lies. The scripture that we'll be covering tonight is in Jeremiah 17. I'm going to uh, look at verses 7 through 8, and you'll find some a familiar uh, ring to it because it also kind of falls in line with Psalm 1. 
Here it goes. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when he comes. It leaves, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. When I was thinking of trusting people and thinking of instances of trusting people, all of us do it. Every single day we're putting trust somewhere. A prime example is when you're getting on the road. You have to have some kind of sense that the people on the road next to you know how to drive their car, that they've been trained to follow the rules, that they know how to do signal when they do lane changes, all those kinds of things. When we're in a huge traffic, um, congested traffic, we really are paying attention to it. But it's all the time. If you go to some other places, like I was in Cambodia uh, many years ago, it was like watching ants drive to me because it wasn't the system I was used to. It was a system they were used to, but not me. But it looked like the scariest thing ever. But even on our roads, people are not paying attention. But we trust that they are. I'll give you an example. Three weeks ago, I was heading to work. It was about quarter to five in the morning. There's not a soul on the road. I'm in the fast lane. Now, I tend to have a lead foot, so I'm a little faster than what the speed limit uh, says, which the speed limit is 65. I'm in about almost to San Leandro, and all of a sudden, in my rear view mirror, I see a car racing up behind me. Its lights are off. It's a four-door sedan. It's probably doing about 100 miles an hour, and it piles into the back of my truck. Now, obviously, that person wasn't following the rules. They weren't, they didn't have their lights on. They didn't have any of those things. They weren't keeping proper spacing. They were definitely speeding. But every day we put ourselves in situations where we're trusting people, and we're going to see that, like in that situation, people do let us down. They do fail us. In this passage, verse 7 says, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. And that trust is, is something that we can, uh, by our reason, by a rational decision, trust somebody. So, for example, I could trust somebody because of their credential. They're a doctor. They went to medical school. I'm going to trust, put trust in them because they have this degree or they have this training. Same thing with the lawyers, same thing with the judge, same thing with pastors. We're going to attribute trust in them by virtue of what they've learned and what they put themselves through. But in this case, we are trusting in the Lord. And what's the Lord's credential? Did he go to college? Does he have a four-year degree? Did he just know? He created heavens and earth. He created us. That's his credential. He sent his son to die for us. So if we're going to trust in anything, trusting in the Lord should be first. Then it says, whose confidence is in him? Now, confidence is different than trust because confidence is trust, but it's an experience. It's over time. Something that we've that we have gone side by side with this person or persons, and we've developed a confidence in them because we have a history. We have that history with the Lord, just like we do with people. We can look back on our faith, and we can see that we tend to forget that. Though we tend to move on in our lives. And forget all the times that God was right there beside us and all those experiences and all the ways he held us or moved along with us or pushed us forward and cared for us. So, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Then it says, 
They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. Now that makes you think of Psalm 1 and about that tree. But my favorite part about this is because you have this trust and you have this confidence, this tree, this example, it does not fear. It doesn't fear the heat. And when I'm thinking of heat, I'm thinking of hard times, I'm thinking of drought, I'm thinking of all those instances in our lives when we might have the potential to fear. But if we trust in the Lord, we keep our confidence in Him, we shouldn't be having any fear. It also says its leaves are always green. So we're always in a good place if we trust in the Lord. It may not seem like it at the time. If we look back in instances, we're like, wow, what is going on? Right now is one of those. Wow, what is going on? But God's in control. God has this. We don't understand it. We don't know everything about it. But we know he knows all about it. And he's working through it. And he has a plan for us in it. Then it says, it has no worries. Now, I don't know about you, but if there's a time to be anxious or be having some worry, this might be a year for the for those. If there's any time in your life, I'm looking back on my 63 years of life and I'm looking at all the things I've been seen or been around, and I'm talking presidential assassinations, spiritual leaders, assassinations, civil rights people, senators. I'm talking Vietnam War. All these kinds of things, I was in those. And people thought those were bad. But on this, when I think about it now, I still think this is the craziest time in our lives. If you think about it, not just locally, but globally, it's the entire world being affected by this. So if we trust in the Lord, no worries. I always say that. Somebody says something to me, hey, Peter, I'm sorry, blah, 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 I'm late. No worries. Or this is going to take longer. No worries. So it's a phrase I use all the time. But in this instance, the no worry is because I have Jesus. The no worry is because I have the Lord. Then it says, in a, and this is no worries in the year of drought. So there's no water. This tree's been by the water. It's sucked up all the water. But in this time, it has no worries, even when there's none of that, because there's trust in the Lord. And this tree never fails to bear fruit, it says. I want to be like that. I don't want to be the guy who's tossed to and fro, thinking about, man, I really should have voted for this guy, or no, I should really vote for this person, or no, man, why can't we get some people together and get this vaccine done quicker, or... Can we get people back to work? Or how about all those families whose loved ones have died? They didn't even get a chance to say goodbye. They're behind a glass wall. They can't even go in their room. I want to be the guy that trusts the Lord and knows the Lord has it. So it's okay to tr have some trust in humans and in human systems, but put God first. Put God first. You know, trust is a foundational thing to our human condition, right? But when we're dealing with people, and we're starting to put people in places where they, we think that they're going to save us from all these things, there's some things that we need to put in place that kind of put our expectations right. Whenever you're feeling like this person's going to solve it for you, or you're going to solve it for yourself, or whenever you're thinking about, hey, I can do this. I don't need God to help me with this. I want you to think about the fact that it says, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. We are all broken, and because we are all broken, our systems are all broken. Everything is broken. It's not perfect, so it's going to be messed up. So set that expectation up front. Don't think, 
hey, this person's better than another. This person's got it. This system's working really well because it's not true. Psalm 118, 8 and 9 says, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. So what's the result of putting God first? We looked at it in Scripture. No worries. No fear. Bearing fruit. Being able to withstand heat. Go through a drought. We can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Hebrews 13, 6. We can also say, Do not be anxious for anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, we all know this. We've read it. We've seen it a million times. I'm not telling you anything new. But what does it take for us to keep, how do we keep on keeping on? How do we keep on in this position of trust when our propensity is to do the fallback and not trust God? So here's some steps. First of all, you're going to make a decision. It's a conscious choice. We have to decide above everything else, we're going to trust God. Now, having said that, as soon as we say that, it's kind of like asking for patience. Something's going to happen and goes, okay, here it comes. You said trust. We're going to work on this right now. Okay? But that is the first step. We have to make that conscious choice. It's intentional. But it is much easier said than done. You have to decide to trust God. The thing is, worry and trust are mutually exclusive, okay? Secondly, you need to constantly monitor your thoughts and feelings. We've got to check in. Now, some of us do that by journaling. You know, I know Andrew does. Many others probably do. But that's a great place to do that. If you prayerfully go through your journal, it's a place for you to check in on all those feelings. In your thoughts. And when that devil starts to creep into your brain and work on your mind, and you start feeling dejected or rejected or fear or anxiety or worry or every other negative thought that crosses your mind, write those things down and go to the Lord with those things and let the Lord know, hey, I'm feeling these things. And I want to depend on you. I want to hold close to you. But you need to monitor your thoughts and Feelings. Another way to do it besides journaling uh, is called the, the examine. It's something St. Ignatius did. He would do it in the evening, and it's examining your day. Okay, There's a little book called Sleeping with Bread um, that would be really helpful with that. It's as simple as that where I felt God the good, the good, and where I felt the bad. Okay. But that's a great place to start and something we should do all the time. Put or keep in check on, see what that is. Thirdly, saturate your heart and mind with the Word of God. We, we've been told this too. Read it. Hear it. Memorize it. Speak it. Saturate your heart and mind with the Word of God. In order to take those worries and thoughts captive, you need something to replace it with. It makes me think of uh, once when I was a kid, I was on a school bus, and there was some song I just could not get out of my head. I'm sure you've experienced that before. And sometimes those songs on the school bus were not so great. But it would stick in your brain, and you're just like, I want this to get out of here. So I remember going, okay. And I, I had rem remembered a bunch of scripture, and I said, okay, and start quoting the scripture that I memorized. And boom, that song was gone. 
in a second because I was filling my mind, replacing it with that thought, with the thoughts of God. So saturate your heart and mind with the Word of God. And then, fourthly, replace your negative thoughts and feelings with the promises of God. There's, open that book. There's a lot of promises in there. And not just that. Do what the children of Israel did. They recalled, they re, reviewed their history where God had been with them. They constantly did that. Might be a good practice for us is to go back and go, okay, God was here, God was here, God was here, God was here. So not just looking at those promises that are in Scripture, but actually look where they touched you experientially, where God touched you. Okay? Once you've taken those thoughts captive, the next thing is to replace them with those promises and then start considering that plan that God has for you. What do I do with all this now that I'm trusting you? Scripture says, but the Helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Miguel, if you put that picture up for me. <clears throat> There's a painting um, behind me. It was painted by an artist in, in Oakland, local artist. Carol Alst is her name. That painting is probably a good 12 years old from the first time I saw it. And you see a person on a trapeze seat there with their arms open, and the other person jumping towards them. Now, I don't know what the title is, but that picture is the lock screen on my phone. It's to remind me. It's a vision to remind me of God and what God does for me. And what the reason I came to that was I was reading uh, some books and I was reading a particular author, a guy named Henry Nowen. Some of you may be familiar with him. And he tells a story of being at a circus and being so enamored and, and so thrilled with what he was seeing. And then one day he says, I was sitting with Rodelay, this is the leader of this troupe of uh, flying trapeze artists, in his caravan and talking about flying. And the secret, Rolay said, is that the flyer does nothing and the catcher does everything. When I fly to Joe, I have simply to stretch out my arms and hands and wait for him to catch me and pull me safe, safely over the apron behind the catch bar. You do nothing, I said, surprised. Nothing, Rolay repeated. The worst thing the flyer can do is try to catch the catcher. If I grab Joe's wrists, I might break them, or he might break mine, and that would be the end of us. A flyer must fly, a catcher must catch, and the flyer must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher will be there for him. So look at this picture. Put yourself out there as the flyer. Remember that God has you. God is the catcher. Lastly, I want to say that trust is the basis of life. Without trust, no human being can live. Trapeze artists are, offer a beautiful image of this. Flyers have to trust their catchers. They can do the most spectacular doubles, triples, and quadruples. But what finally makes their performance spectacular are the catchers who are there for them at the right time. in the right place. God is always there at the right time and the right place. Will you pray with me? Father God, we just praise you and thank you for who you are and how you work in our lives. We thank you that we can fly through the air with peace knowing that you have us, that we can go through times such as ours now and not get wrapped up in people and having them solve the problem, 
but remember that you have it. So we put our trust in you and follow you and depend on you to catch us. We thank you, Lord, that you do. You don't drop us. You got this. You have us. Thank you for what you've done in our lives. Thank you for what you did with your son, Jesus. And that's the ultimate catch when we come to you in glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Greetings to everyone in the Solano Church family and friends. It is such a privilege to share a message this morning from God's Word. But first, will you pray with me? Father God, thank you for this opportunity to share your Word with my sisters and brothers. Give me an anointing of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you guide my thoughts and words as I deliver the message. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. We are living in tumultuous times. I've lived in four countries, and this includes 45 years in the U.S. Never have I lived through anything like this year, 2020. Not in the U.S., nor anywhere else. This year has made me even more grateful that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. His teachings, his commandments, and his promises have given me the strength to manage my frustrations, anxieties, anger, confusion, and to respond to temptations to doubt the sovereignty of God. Why is our world the way it is? As Christians, how should we respond or how should we engage with the world? Here is a quote from Pastor Andrew from last week. We weep that so much hope is put in the political sphere. The reality is that the problems in our world, the problems in our country, run so much deeper than what any political side would be able to address or fix. We know as followers of Jesus that the biggest problem of our world is sin. And if we try to find a fix for that in a place and way that cannot possibly fix it, we're going to continue to be frustrated. We need change on the inside. And my message will be addressing how we can approach this change on the inside today. Our God is a God of order. So chaos is what the enemy stirs up and thrives in. As Christians, we recognize that the current disorder is the manifestation of spiritual warfare. Last week, Pastor Andrew cited Ephesians 6.12. And I would read that now. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the comic cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul is not alone in warning us. Similar warnings about the enemy come from James, John, and Peter. So from James, he said, Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And from John, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And from Peter, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour so as a Christian community in East Bay of California, how should we respond given the warnings by Paul and the others? No one is exempted from spiritual attack. How do we respond to such attack as a Christian? In executing our Church Unleashed vision, 
How do we equip ourselves to be effective ambassadors of Christ going forward? Given the vitriol, the acrimony, the anxieties, and the unreasonableness that surround us. This morning, I'm going to share a spiritual discipline that might, God willing, lead you in the important work of producing change on the inside. This is a spiritual discipline that gets you to examine yourself so as to assess your spiritual wellness to deal with the world beset by ungodliness. In Ephesians 6, 13 to 18, Paul recommends that we put on the armor of God. I know many of us have studied this famous passage in Sunday school multiple times and probably heard more than one sermon about it. The question I'm raising today is how do we apply it to ourselves? So without more ado, uh, reading from verse 13 of chapter 6, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as gospel shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. An illustration of this passage would be appropriate at this point. So you see here we have a Roman soldier and all the components of the spiritual armor uh, around, on him. Uh, you see six of the seven components we have the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, shield of faith, sword of the spirit, gospel of the shoes of the gospel peace. What, what you don't see in this picture is in fact the most important component, which is in your mind and in your heart and, and using your lips, and that is to pray in the spirit. So Paul use this metaphor of a Roman soldier. Why did he do that? In Paul's day, the Roman army was second to none. It was the awesome offensive war machine that Rome employed to expand and to protect the Roman Empire. It was at its greatest geographical expense in the first century AD. The empire stretched across 3,000 miles from east to west, embracing all territories north and south surrounding the great Mediterranean Sea. The power of the Roman army enabled a 200-year period of relative tranquility for this huge empire, a period often referred to as Pax Romana or Roman peace. Paul lived in this period. Each Roman soldier was an efficient and effective weapon of war. He was totally dependent on Rome for his equipment, for his supplies, for his training, for leadership, for orders, for strategies and tactics. He was also trained to depend on the men in his fighting unit and trained that he can be depended upon by them. So when Paul asks us to put the armor of God, which is spiritual armor, I think he has in mind that a Christian can become an awesome, efficient, and an effective soldier for Christ. By analogy, just as the Roman soldier is dependent on Rome, the Christian soldier is dependent on God 
for everything he needs to take on the enemy. So putting on each piece of the armor is a discipline in self-examination in preparation for battle. Paul wanted us to be strongly anchored in biblical teaching, on biblical teaching, on truth, on righteousness, on the gospel of peace, on salvation, and on faith, and re to rely on scripture to guide us, and on prayers to get support from Almighty God. Let us explore how to examine ourselves with each component of the spirit of armor. Uh, next slide. This table presents the checklist for us to use in the self-examination. Going methodically through the checklist will make you aware of your spiritual condition, which is critical to face spiritual attacks. And uh, I've made the checklist next to each item of the component of the armor. And the first on truth is integrity check on yourself. And briefly, what that is, is what truth do you believe in? Where do you get that truth? How does it measure up against the teachings of Jesus Christ? The second one on righteousness is a humility check. And this is one that I will go deeper in, in, into in a minute uh, to use as an example of how you should practice this discipline. The shalom check comes with the gospel of peace. And then the shield of faith is basically to check who or what do you trust in. And then the helmet of salvation is where does our security come from. And then the two offensive uh, components of the armor, which is the sword of the spirit, which is God's word, and prayer in the spirit uh, is the other offensive weapon. So the sword of the spirit is where is your power source? And then the prayer in the spirit is access to a helpline to God. So let me now turn to give you more uh, de details by, by example, using the breastplate of righteousness, which I call the humility check. So we need to examine where we stand on righteousness. And God's word tells us, first from Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And from the Old Testament, the same message, the Lord looks down from heaven on the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. And if you think of the two great commandments uh, that Jesus uh, told us to obey? Is there anyone amongst us who can safely claim that he or she has loved the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and love their neighbor as themselves? And in the Sermon on the Mount, which is uh, here, as I'm quoting from Matthew 5, verse 20, Jesus said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we know that the scribes and Pharisees have over 600 laws on top of the Ten Commandments. How can we exceed that? Jesus was telling us that there is no way we can satisfy God on our own. And then he tells us we must be perfect. And you see in Matthew 5, 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Going through these verses in self-examination, you ought to be convinced that 
and I'm convinced that I have no righteousness that meets God's standard. And that is why Christ had to pay the costly price in being tortured, insulted, and crucified, and then to die on the cross. He did this so that we can be reconciled to God and we can be cloaked in His righteousness to stand before our Father in heaven. We are saved by grace alone. And Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And yet, in the Beatitudes, which is also in the Sermon on the Mount, God tells us in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. The righteousness that we should hunger and thirst for is Christ's righteousness. I hope you see that through this self-examination, we should be humble if we understand that we are saved by grace and if we believe it, we are in a much better position to erase our personal pride. Humility is an essential quality to be an effective ambassador for Christ. We should never consider ourselves to be morally superior to anyone else, including those who hold different views or opinions from us. And certainly, we should not consider ourselves morally superior to the people who are non-believers and who are people we are trying to reach. I hope this example of the humility check will encourage you to try and practice using the armor of God to examine yourself on all the other spiritual components in the armor. This is work in progress for me, but I can testify that during the recent difficult months of 2020, I have carried out this practice as often as I can, especially when my mind is at sea. Doing so has brought me some measure of shalom, the kind of shalom that only God can give. So that's why I'm here to share this with you this morning, and I hope you try it. And if you do get to try it, I think you will experience at least one or more of the four outcomes by doing so. Next chart. First, I hope that you will experience spiritual growth through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. As I was doing this, I feel the Holy Spirit working with me. And I believe that if you desire to self-examine with respect to the armor, you will find that the Holy Spirit will be helping you do that. Uh, secondly, you might f discover a greater dependency on God, that that is important. Thirdly, you may find that you desire fellowship with the church community. You will look to the church community to help you resolve the struggles that you're going through. And at the same time, you will also feel more commitment to help other brothers and sisters who are struggling as well. And last but not least, I hope you'll gain more confidence to be an effective ambassador for Christ. So thank you for your attention. Uh, Will you pray with me? Father, thank you again for this opportunity to share your word with my sisters and brothers. I pray for your Holy Spirit to seed your truth in each person so as to promote spiritual growth and to prepare 
against spiritual attacks that will surely come our way. With gratitude, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.